Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me back there? Or shall I speak louder? I tend to have a tendency to speak too softly. If you can hear me in the back, just raise your hand. All right, that's good. Thank you so much, Sharad, for that uh, very kind introduction. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for coming. I've been attending conferences in the mobile computing and networking community for a very long time. And I used to attend them as a researcher, um, like many of the people here, and then as an organizer. And it's really an honor to be back as a speaker. And one of the best things is to actually uh, find so many old friends here and uh, make some new friends and uh, reconnect with the community. And uh, I really want to thank the organizers for, uh, for giving me that opportunity. It's really been a pleasure. You know, when I attended uh, conferences like this, what I would usually talk about are the kinds of things that are near and dear to our hearts. Mobile networks, applications, protocols, architectures, algorithms, and so on. And today I'm not going to talk about any of that, or almost none of that. And my talk is going to be very different from the norm at Mobisys and uh, at conferences of this type. And, uh, but I think you will find that it connects to some of the concerns that you have and some of the areas that all of us are working on. And what I'm going to spend time to, today to talk about is really philanthropy. And in particular, using technology to address some of the world's most complex challenges. So what do I mean by that? Well, we are inundated by complex challenges. We have a relentlessly warming planet. We have species on the brink of extinction. We have pandemics that are out of control. Infrastructure and inequality problems and homelessness, inability to deliver critical services to rural areas, and a crumbling supply chain and infrastructure in many parts of the world. And these challenges have been addressed traditionally by philanthropy in a variety of ways. For instance, by providing direct aid to underserved communities, or by actually providing even something even better, which is you know, building uh, infrastructure, you know, homes, schools, clinics, and the like. Sometimes by providing technology itself, laptops and so on to school children in, in, in underserved areas. And sometimes by medical interventions and delivery of vaccines and medicines and so on. And this work is very important and has been done historically by a wide variety of organizations. And it's very critical and it should continue. But the world of philanthropy has changed in the last decade or so. And this is what I want to talk about, is the new philanthropy. And what I want to talk a little bit about is what we are Vulcan at doing in this area and the contributions we are making towards the new philanthropy. So before I start doing that, first of all, actually, how many people know uh, what Vulcan is or have heard of Vulcan? Or a show of hands, it's, uh, as I expected. How many people know Paul Allen or have heard of Paul Allen? Much more so, right? Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft and founded Vulcan about 30 years ago, starting out as his family office, looking after his investments and so on. But over the years, it has become much broader, much more ambitious, and much more diverse. And at Vulcan, what we really try to do is we try to tackle super hard problems to make the world a better place. This includes trying to understand the complexities of the human being also to look at the fundamental operations of life and of cells. The Vulcan Frontiers Group is funding cutting edge research in life sciences across the world. The Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Vulcan Aerospace is building the largest aircraft in the world that is going to be used as a reusable launch vehicle for space exploration. Vulcan Capital has investments in many technology and non-technology companies. Uh, you know, ranging from startups to mature companies, marquee names, including Uber and Flipkart and so on, and uh, includes uh, financing all the way from early rounds up to and including uh, private equity uh, and, and uh, fixed income funds. Vulcan Real Estate, as Sharath kindly mentioned, has uh, been instrumental in changing neighborhoods and revitalizing communities 
in very fundamental ways. We have a film production arm. And Balkan Film Production has been very successful in terms of raising awareness about the issues that we care about. This year, there were two films that were documentaries that were nominated for the Oscars. And of course, some landmark and marquee sports teams, museums, and a lot more. The things that I haven't mentioned on this list are the things that I'm going to talk about today, which are very critical and central to Balkan, which are philanthropy and technology. And what's unique at Balkan is that all these things that you see on the left-hand side can be leveraged for technology and philanthropy, and they are. So we work closely with the AI Institute. We work with aerospace in some of the projects that I want to describe. And film production has been very helpful for us, for instance, in terms of raising awareness of our message. And we also do capital investments in promising startups that aim to address these problems. So it's really a very unique opportunity and a very unique place to work. And I'm really honored to be uh, the first CTO that Vulcan has had in its history to take on this challenge of moving the company forward by applying technology. So the thing that's very exciting about this is that our approach to these hard problems is that we don't apply band-aids. We identify root causes, look at systematic change, take risks, and collaborate deeply with our partners. We can't do anything by ourselves. Once we identify a problem, we research the landscape, develop a plan, and take action. And then this is what's critical. We evaluate the results using hard metrics as much as possible. And if things aren't working, we sunset projects and kill them. Or we adjust the approach and re reapply. And this kind of cycle is actually at the heart of the new philanthropy. And what I want to talk about is sort of the landscape that we're in. We are at a unique historical moment for applying technology to philanthropy. Philanthropy historically actually has not had a lot of input from technology, or if it has, it has had it in very limited ways. But that is really changing. And there's a confluence of macro factors that are leading to that. The first is the vast increase in attention and resources to philanthropy and social investment across the board. For instance, in the US alone, in the last 30 years, philanthropic investment has increased by a factor of two and a half after investing for inflation. A lot of that investment has come from technology pioneers, you know, Zuckerberg, Gates, Omidyar, and Paul Allen. And they are changing the landscape of philanthropy in very interesting ways, and that relate to the way that you and I think about these problems. They bring their business acumen, data-driven decision-making, metrics for accountability, and funding for impacts and not for activities. And the third major macro force that's driving this is technology adopting, adoption in developing countries. And actually, this is something that all of you are really contributing to and are responsible for, because not only has the work that this community has done brought about new technology, it has lowered the costs of that technology, making it much more affordable. But more importantly, it has increased technical literacy so that adoption of new technology is much easier than it ever was. And that's a really critical force. And so this confluence is what's exciting about working in this space. And um, really, I do think that like the revolutions we've seen in uh, in the past, in technical areas, this we're at the cusp of a new revolution on applying technology to philanthropic aims. So, Vulcan technology itself, as part of Vulcan, works on a variety of things. We do things in emerging technology. Uh, we work on augmented reality, new types of media immersive, uh, immersive media experiences, uh, Internet of Things, uh, machine intelligence, predictive analytics, and so on. Uh, all of which we are trying to take to market in one form or another. And today, I'm not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is really our focus on technology for philanthropy. And uh, here's a brief uh, video that sort of tries to summarize that. Thank you. 
endless diversity and scope of projects is what makes my job really interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the five areas that are our key focus for technology for philanthropy. The first is wildlife conservation, and I'm going to describe a couple of key projects there, the Great Elephant Census and anti-poaching drones. The second is climate change and the Smart City Challenge, uh, which was uh, recently announced uh, this week, the winners were announced. Ocean Health, I'll describe Finprint, a project in that area. Um, pandemic prevention, so many of you may be aware, a couple of years ago, Paul Allen made a commitment of $100 million to fight Ebola in West Africa, and uh, recently there have been investments in fighting Zika. And then uh, areas near to our heart, strengthening communities in particular through connectivity, and I'll describe some of those efforts as well, that project. And underlying all of those projects is a kind of an impact model that I use to think about them. The first is that all these are very complex social problems. And what we recognize is that technology is not a panacea. Technology is one part of the solutions to these problems. But there's an intersection where technology can have, at its best, a catalytic impact, where you can take something to the next level because technology becomes a critical enabler. One such area is bringing foundational data to the discussion of these problems. And I'll describe some of the projects that we're doing there. And that is the first and most obvious way where technology intersects with these problems. That foundational data is critical and is often lacking in public discourse. But that data is critical for awareness, for policy and research, for legislation, and for enforcement. And technology can act on these axes as well. But most of our work so far has been on the foundational data side. And that is a model that we use over and over. And we found it to be very, very impactful. So I'm going to start with the first project that we've been working on that I'll describe, which is wildlife conservation. And as some of you might know, over the past 40 years, half of the world's wildlife has disappeared. So if you just take as an example uh, the black line on this chart, uh, 1970, there were an estimated 70,000 black rhinos in the world. Now they're down to a couple of thousand, and they're supremely endangered. It's the same story applies for elephants. And this is partly driven by the law of supply and demand. The street value in Asia for ivory, for instance, is hundreds of millions of dollars. Rhino horn is supposed to have magical properties in certain parts of the world. And the per kilogram price for rhino horn exceeds that of cocaine. Poaching and trafficking in these materials has become an industry, has become something that's carried out by militias and by organized uh, crime. Uh, at the level that of drugs and human trafficking. And the governments, the NGOs, and the elephants themselves are really no match for the resources that are being applied to this industry. The first question that we wanted to ask was, what is the scale of the problem? And we funded the Great Elephant Census. And this next video will describe that a little bit. Africa. We are losing elephants every 15 minutes. 96 elephants a day. We are between 25 and 30,000 elephants. And we cannot save the world's largest land mammal. The prognosis for wildlife conservation is bleak. The elephants are under the greatest pressure they've probably ever been. This elephant was shot on Tuesday. It's an incomprehensible amount. It hurts to see that animal being killed just because you want a pair of tusks. And for what you want the tusks, I can't even explain. Many elephants, guys. I don't know. We know how fast we're losing elephants, but how many elephants currently exist. idea of a new Pan-African Orphan Survey is desperately needed. We're in the middle of a crisis, and the big question now is what's going to happen to the elephants? There's so many unknowns, and this survey will provide us with some of the most important information ever to conserving the long-term survival of elephants. The information is power. If you have the information, you can move mountains.
think that should give some background as to the fate of some of our brethren on this planet, some of the most magnificent animals that has, evolution has produced. When you look at the Great Elephant Census, though, it's a huge effort and a very substantial undertaking. But if you look at what the actual technology is, it's pretty unsophisticated. As you saw in the video, it's three or four people who get into a single-engine Cessna and fly over the savanna. What they have to do is to pl uh, fly sample paths in a predefined way. And then you have researchers looking out over the wings to spot elephants and count them, basically using pencil and paper. And, uh, you know, one of the critical problems with that is that if the sample paths are wrong, the surveys are meaningless and the results are not statistically useful. Typically the way this is done, the technology that's applied is that the pilots fly this using whatever equipment's available on whatever plane that they're flying. And the first thing that we did was we built a hardware and software solution to actually make that survey, that manual survey, just much more accurate. So this is the flight logger. This is, uh, we used a hacked up Android phone. Uh, along with our own commercial software, I mean our own uh, proprietary software, and uh, 3D printed the chassis. In a couple of months we built this, and what it does is it allows the researchers to feed in the sample paths, which are known as transects, the transect of Safana, and um, what their locations are, and also the altitude above ground level. That's very critical. If you fly too high, this is a sample after all. If you fly too high, you see too few elephants. If you fly too low, you see too many. And this simple piece of equipment was really invaluable to the pilots. They never had a consolidated place where they could be much more statistically accurate in terms of flying this. And uh, we, we built this in the lab, and then we built many, many more. And they've been used throughout the census in many countries, and it's been very successful. And um, you know, that's been very useful for the census as a whole. But really, if you think about it, the way we're doing this is really not the way we should do it. It shouldn't be by means of four guys, and it's mostly guys jumping into a Cessna. Really, the way this should be done, using the technology that this industry develops, you all develop, is by means of UAVs, drones, flying overhead with high-res image cameras and computer vision and machine learning to detect elephants, count them, put them into a database, put an API on top, and make it available to researchers and NGOs and governments worldwide. And that's what we're doing. So we're using a fixed frame uh, drone that's commercially available. And on top of that, uh, we're building our own hardware and software. Uh, the many requirements for this, the first of it being that it should be very simple. It should be hand launchable. And uh, the team just returned from uh, one of several trips to Botswana to do testing. And as an example, uh, here's sort of the launch process. <laughs> And on board, we have uh, hardware and software that does the actual counting of the elephants. And I'll spend a few minutes describing that. So essentially what this is is an image recognition problem. And um, I'll spend a few minutes describing what we've done there. Um, any problem of this type, you have to do image classification. What objects are in the image that are taken by the high resolution camera? And where are the objects located in that image? Now, People in this community have been working on this kind of problem for a long time, and we know that there are many methods for image recognition, histogram-oriented, uh, support vector machines, linear classifiers, and so on. But what's really taken off in the last couple of years is deep learning and the use of neural networks. So for instance, uh, if you look at uh, the error rate in the ImageNet uh, uh, archive, uh, it's gone down uh, by the use of these algorithms from around 30% to you know, uh, you know, the single digits. And aside from the algorithms themselves, what's become available are the GPUs that allow these algorithms to be run uh, at high speed. And we're essentially uh, using that neural network approach for image recognition. There are well-known benefits and challenges. I won't go into that. They're probably familiar to many of you here. And the approach we're using is basically a CNN, convolutional neural network. And these uh, essentially exploit spatially local correlations. And they assure a local connectivity pattern between neurons. And each stage of the network and uh, of at, at, at each adjacent layer. And uh, so, for instance, in the CNNs that we're doing, uh, the basic features build into more complex shapes as the image is passed through different layers of the neural network. So at the lowest level, you can get the bottom features, which are basic, which are maybe lines and curves. In the middle, you can start forming them into the parts of an elephant, you know, the ears, the trunk. And then eventually, these parts come together and are recognized uh, as a full object. And this has been um, working very well for us. Uh, this is all processing that's done on board. And 
the model performance uh, in our experiment so far has been has been very good. Um, you know, we're getting graph values of around uh, 0.8, and 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 we know that as we get more data, as we get more experience, and we tune the algorithms, it'll get much better. And um, you know, we're we're hoping to uh, uh, complete this deployment uh, this year. So. Even in this project, though, there are a number of observations and lessons learned already that I just wanted to share with you. The first is that you have to adapt the solutions to the workflow. So going back to the manual surveys where people get into a Cessna and fly around, and then they check off the elephants that they've seen on paper or on a clipboard, our first reaction was, well, of course, that should be some kind of an iPad app or a mobile app, and it all should be automated. And what we found out is that that just didn't work. That did not fit into the researcher's workflow. iPads are expensive. They need charging. They're prone to theft. They break down. And in fact, the researchers were just not interested. What was interesting to them was a flight logger, which would enable the pilot to fly a much more accurate uh, transect. And the pilot is technically literate, has, is used to looking at a variety of instruments, and that is the key to find what is the technology intervention that actually makes sense for this particular problem. And not to go in with a preconceived notion of what uh, is required, because the workflow, changing the workflow is just too hard. Solutions have to be dead simple uh, for the drones, for instance, and local collaborators are the key. Um, you have to invest in training and skill set capacity building. Failures are very hard to recover from in this space. Uh, people have been flying drones in Africa in some of the national parks. There have been failures, and many of the park managers are now burned and are very skeptical about any new technology coming in. And you really have to smart, start small and build confidence. And finally, what we learned you know, is hardware and software and computer science people is that flight operations are actually very hard. <laughs> and uh, uh, platforms and operations can consume a huge amount of your resources for the project. And uh, this is something that's not to be underestimated. Um, as we do more of this, I'm sure will be uh, other le lessons that we learned. But so far, we're very optimistic about the particular interventions that we're doing. Of course, none of this could be done without our partners, some very marquee names, the Wildlife Conservation Society, African Parks, Design and Wildlife Research Institute, and many others. So we talked so far about counting the elephants, but one of the key threats is really poaching, as I mentioned earlier. And this is something that the governments and NGOs in this area just are having a very difficult time with. Game reserves and national parks are very large. Poaching activities require very little time. A single nighttime raid can you know, decimate dozens of elephants. And uh, manpower to do the enforcement is sparse. Ranges are limited, equipment is limited, and technology solutions that have been deployed are very costly. So what we're doing is to take the drones that we've developed for counting elephants and uh, equipping them with more onboard intelligence so we can do actual anti-poaching efforts. The user is assigns a region of interest, the transects that I showed in the earlier pictures. and. Um, you know, the image taken from the camera is run through the neural network, similar to what I described before, and is run on the GPU to define a computer, you know, using a computer vision model to see what are objects of interest. On top of that, there's a flight director which does the actual steering of the drone itself, and that adds another layer of intelligence, which verifies the objects that have been classified. We know that the computer vision is never going to be 100% accurate, so uh, we need to do another level of filtering. And the flight director decides the next steps. For instance, if there's a break in a fence, well, maybe that's something that's noted and the uh, operation continues. But if there's a suspicious vehicle, maybe a canoe or a pickup uh, truck or a bunch of people on horseback where they shouldn't be, then the uh, director can raise the alert, abort the mission, and return to base so that further interventions can take place. And um, you know, one of the things that, you know, th that needs to happen is that the flight director needs to take the imperfect inf information that's coming from the computer vision and verify it. Um, so the, one of the, the things that we do is to determine the GPS coordinates of all potential object sightings and then verify that in successive images that the same object is recognized at the same GPS coordinates. So in this case, the, the green object is recognized at a particular GPS coordinate. A second later, perhaps, the drone has moved and the same object is recognized again. That gives a degree of confidence um, and some redundancy in the computer vision. Um, and this is an image from the actual camera that's taken on from the, from the drone. On the upper left there are some elephants in this case that were recognized. A second later, the drone has moved closer. The same objects are recognized from uh, the same GPS position. And then a, th a second later, um, the same objects are recognized, uh, you know, slightly modified at the same GPS coordinates. And this kind of algorithms are the ones that we're working on to add more intelligence to the system. 
So in terms of the impact model, what we've talked about are two things where technology can, can, can play a part. One is on foundational data, and the other is on enforcement with the anti-poaching drones. When you think about this, stepping back from the individual projects, do you think any activity of this kind is really a supply chain problem? And it's like any product in the world. There is a source, um, there's a transshipment of some kind, and then demand. In this case, the source is the elephants. The transshipment is the ivory trafficking networks that are global at this space, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, time, and demand, which is typically in East Asia, for ivory is highly prized there. And the key observation is whenever there's a supply chain, there is data. And that is where technology can have a really critical impact. Uh, so for instance, in our current generation, we're doing aerial surveys and making an elephant database, which is going into uh, you know, the UN uh, bodies for, uh, uh, you know, for making policy changes. And our next generation is looking at anti-poaching drones and uh, recognition and longitudinal surveys. And um, you know, looking at these problems from sort of a product and supply chain perspective is really useful for seeing how can technology be applied. Because this is exactly the way that we apply technology to building any product, whether it's smartphones or software. And as you look at this, then you see the other commonalities involved. Uh, that, that, that emerge. And the technology that's required is actually the technologies that many of you in this room are really experts at. Embedded software, computer vision, machine learning, databases, middleware, visualization, big data, mobile applications and networks, and more. And so really, this is an opportunity to take the things that you work on and apply them to really, really important problems. The second project I'm going to highlight is the one on ocean health, and it's a project uh, called FinPrint. And uh, FinPrint was born out of a realization that just like elephants, which are apex land mammals, sharks and rays, which are critical apex sea mammals, are under threat. So if you were to hazard a guess, how many sharks of all species do you think were pulled from the water worldwide? last year? Hazard a guess. 100,000? Maybe. 500,000? Maybe a million? No. Current estimates are that 100 million sharks were killed every year for their fins and meat. Humanity is on a course that is not sustainable if we are to preserve our planet. Approximately a quarter of the species of sharks and rays are threatened with extinction. What's worse, we actually don't even really know much about this problem. There's not much data that's available. We don't have a good understanding of, about how these apex species interact with the rest of the ecosystem, the coral reefs, the ocean currents, the lesser fauna and flora. There's very little information. So we're continuing to overfish without knowing what we're doing. The FinFrin project tries to solve some of that. Right now, there's this belief within the scientific community that if you remove sharks from coral reefs, it creates trophic cascades. The reefs become very degraded and potentially shift from a coral reef system into a more algae-dominated system. But there was never a thorough experimental setup to demonstrate this. Gloves stand for baited remote underwater video, and it's a technique that we're using increasingly because it doesn't have any kind of invasive qualities. We bait the camera, and anything that's attracted to the smell of the bait follows up the current or the odor corridor and gets captured on camera, and we're able to count them, and that's how we generate these kind of indexes of relative abundance. It's a really versatile technique that we can apply to many different areas and different habitats and we can collect the same standardized set of data. We've sampled about three or four different continents now with this technique. As opposed to focusing on specific areas or specific questions, we're rolling this out on a global scale to assess coral reef shark abundance on the coral reefs throughout the world. So that's why we have the hard PVC on the outside so the sharks can't 
bite of it? We're heavily reliant on forming a, a good team of collaborators and people that are going to be able to assist us, particularly in regions of the world where it's very expensive to travel to. Without these collaborators, it would almost be impossible to attempt this global project. We're at a really critical point now where BRUVs are gaining acceptance in the scientific community as a methodology and because of its versatility I think we can really push this out on a global scale and get the data set standardized so that we can answer these questions of what is the situation with reef sharks around the world? Are they in ridiculously imperiled as much as we see coral for example or are there specific species on coral reefs that adapt faster than others and how are we going to witness these changes especially in the face of climate change over the next couple of decades. The technical approach we're taking is to actually provide the information that's required to process this information from these baited traps. We have to track where those traps are dropped and uh, key capture the key characteristics of this location. There's millions of miles of footage, video footage that's generated um, that's currently examined manually. And we're building tools for video review and annotation. And then obviously moving towards object recognition so we can try to automate that entire process. We're very far from being able to count individual sharks in that environment, but uh, we can certainly streamline that process and make it much more efficient. This is a project that has, you know, because it's in the ocean, a lot of times it's not front of mind to a lot of people, but it is fundamentally important um, to, uh, to ocean health. And we expect that the outcome will be the foundation of a global data, uh, you know, open access service database which can be used by researchers and governments worldwide, which can quantify overfishing, threatened species, and ecosystem impacts in a variety of ways. Our partners are uh, several governments as well as universities. So that's ocean health. And the third project I want to talk about very briefly is going to be around uh, strengthening communities with rural connectivity, particularly for Africa. And the project I want to discuss is Mawingo. And um, as many of you know, that providing connectivity in rural Africa is very difficult due to lack of infrastructure, political issues, economic constraints, and so on. Nearly three quarters of Kenyans are without internet access. Many people are familiar with these statistics. Four billion people cannot afford to use the internet, even if it's available. And the calculation, rough calculation, is to enable connectivity for all. Services must cost no more than 2 or $3 per month, which is a very severe price point. There's been a huge amount of technical work that's been done in this space by many people in this community, and there are probably more experts on the technology here than, than, than me. Uh, but you know, some of the work that's been done in community cellular networks, uh, where a community gets together and basically essentially starts operating a telco, um, extending telcos by using village phone models. And I worked on that when I was at Google um, in, try, in terms of trying to make, that avail make data available through these uh, systems. A cheaper backhaul uh, and uh, MVNO models. And then a low-cost ISP, uh, which we're calling Mawingu. Uh, this is a work that's been sponsored in part by uh, Microsoft and USAID. And what Mawingu tries to do is defer, deliver affordable and fast and reliable Wi-Fi internet access, with the network in particular being powered by solar energy. You know, one of the big constraints in this area is not only that connectivity is sparse, but power is sparse, and it's not available reliably. And getting reliable power becomes a big part of the business model for these, uh, for these operators. What we're doing here is really not a direct technology intervention. Of course, there's technology to be developed. But what we're looking at is a new model where what we're doing, approaching this as a social impact investment. Instead of a purely philanthropic investment where you put in the money and then you lose all of it in some sense from a financial point of view in exchange for social good, here we're trying to hope to get some of it back or maybe all of it back, a 0% return or a small percentage return. And really, it's exploring the business model. That's the, that's the, key, uh, that, that's the key driver here for us. Uh, the deployment, for instance, in Laikopia is a microcosm of rural Kenya. Three quarters of it is rural. Most, the vast majority of households are off the grid. People have phones, but they cannot use the internet very much because of affordability. The average capita income is $358, which is squarely in the lowest world's poorest billion. And if this model works here, maybe it could work elsewhere around the world. The 
technology approach itself is not dramatic in some ways. It's using, basically the network consists of fiber to microwave or TV white spaces to Wi-Fi to the handset. Um, we've discovered that broadband access can be provided up to 500 kilometers from the nearest fiber head. Uh, download and upward speeds, nominally up to 20 megabits, are possible. And a demonstration network was built in 2014 with 16 hotspots. The network of agents that are Wi-Fi providers essentially sell and evangelize the service. And a lot of data is being gathered, which Moving is using to understand uh, usage trends. So far, that 16-node network has grown to 100 nodes. And it's serving consumers and small businesses at an affordable rate of 2 or $3 per month. And uh, this has been, as an investment, sufficiently promising that uh, you know, a modest investment has been obtained from uh, the uh, OPEC to scale this across Kenya. And once this becomes a reality, there are many, many applications that could become useful. Conservation, uh, home automation, Internet of Things. Uh, we think of Internet of Things as smart thermostats and so on. But in rural Africa, Internet of Things uh, uh, you know, could be you know, a matter of uh, life and death in terms of uh, protecting crops or cattle and, and, and warning of dangers, infrastructure dangers. And then, of course, uh, stimulating business. A partner is Microsoft, and if you have deep questions about this, you should talk to Victor, who's sitting right here, and uh, he can uh, he can perhaps answer. Um, so I wanted to step back from these three projects, and 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 uh, you know we've talked a little bit about wildlife conservation, you, the work we've done on drones, um, ocean health, and we've talked about rural connectivity. And here are some of the things that st that that stand out for me. The first is that these are some tremendous challenges. The technical challenge, innovations are required in almost all areas of computing and systems. For example, in wildlife conservation, what do you do when there are forests? Image recognition doesn't work that well. We have alternative means, but they're very inefficient. So can we think about foliage penetrating radar? Can we use bioacoustics? Can we think about networks of sensors? Can we think of predictive analytics and algorithms? These are all areas that this community has deep expertise in. Then there are broader issues of infrastructure and policy. So how can we build platforms that scale across all these efforts? What are the types of metrics that we should use? Open hardware and software initiatives so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, you know, the drone industry is going through kind of the evolution that the PC industry went through, where it started from hobbyist club, homebrew clubs, to you know, the PC, uh, which was sort of you know, the first entry to mass market, and then eventually to uh, you know, uh, Linux-based uh, workstations and so on. Can we, can we follow that same trend? Uh, open data and open science. So you know, that's a, a new way of looking at things so that all these results are available everywhere. And you'd be surprised at how little of that information is available in phil the philanthropic world. Business models, social, social impact investments are really key. No one can fund a project of any of this type indefinitely. There has to be sustainability built in, and local capacity has to be developed. And then, in my view, this is a new discipline that's emerging, similar to the discipline of mobile computing that emerged, say, about 20, 25 years ago. And, and that's multidisciplinary, and that has its always its own challenges. There are detractors, there are skeptics. Um, at Vulcan, for instance, we are able to take advantage because we have our own aerospace division. So we have people with deep expertise in flight operations and drones. Not every organization has that. But even when they do, uh, the folks who are experts in aerospace want to work on the cool, shiny stuff. And drones seem to be kind of boring and low tech. But I have to remind people that that's what people thought about uh, PCs when uh, people were working on the IBM 360. So um, uh, all the challenges of a new discipline are, are emerging. And they have to be dealt with systematically. And What's exciting is we're at the start of all this, really. And I don't see this stopping. This is going to be a, a process that's going to continue for the next 100 years. We have deep challenges ahead of us. And all of these things will have to be, have to be developed. And that's what we're trying to do at Vulcan Technology. So I just want to take a few minutes and uh, just tell you a little bit about my personal journey, and uh, if you'll indulge me, and how I got here. Um, so, you know, I started out as a researcher at uh, Belcor, which has now become Telcordia. I attended conferences like this, doing patents, uh, papers, prototypes, and uh, trying to get published as fast as possible. And there's many top tier conferences with 16% and uh, acceptance rates and lower. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and help to organize some of those conferences and may push the acceptance rates lower still. Um, 
But, uh, you know, one of the things that I found was that I was hungering for, for more impact. And uh, I left research uh, in some sense and moved to Google to work on products. And what was attractive to me there was the ability to have sort of more immediate gratification, if that's, uh, if that's how I can call it. Uh, but, you know, I'd been working in uh, wireless research, for instance, at uh, NTT Docomo, which is a great company, cutting edge. But what I found was that it was, very, it was almost impossible for me to have impact uh, working on the satellite lab of a large company which did not have operations locally. Uh, Google gave me the opportunity to work on really large-scale problems and have immediate impact globally. I'm immensely grateful for that. Uh, I worked on our first products for mobile search and advertising. I worked on our first location-based services platform. So if any of you use Google Maps, the blue dot that you see on Google Maps, which tells you where you are, was done by my team. I'm very proud of that because it was done before GPS was widely available on cell phones. And we used a variety of crowdsourcing and artificial intelligence techniques to make that happen. And then for the last five years or so at Google, I worked on uh, mobile advertising. What was fun there was when I started working on that project, uh, everybody said, ah, that's a boring project. None of my peers wanted to work on it. The real money is in desktop advertising. That's how Google makes 95% of its revenue. Um, that's where the big bucks are. The stuff is boring. Who's going to click on these ads on these little mobile devices anyway? And Ah, you're, all you're doing is taking these desktop ads and sticking them on little, little uh, screens. What's the big deal here? I felt differently, and uh, in five years, we went from almost no revenue to a multi-billion dollar business, uh, and I was leading the engineering team for that. That was very gratifying. I can't take credit for it, of course. It was the explosion of mobile that was made pe possible by people like you, but we did a lot of innovations in terms of uh, user interface, infrastructure, and uh, application of AI. And um, after I'd done that for a few years, and I'd sort of felt like, OK, I know how to take a software product and bring it to market and be, it could be successful. Um, Google had just bought Motorola. I moved to Motorola and worked on the Moto X smartphone, which was a whole different experience for me, uh, working on a physical artifact that sits on a shelf. And you get immediate feedback from the market, whether it's selling or not. And I was uh, leading some of our key applications uh, that were differentiators on that phone. Um, we ended that year on uh, 20 top 10 lists, including uh, Game Changer of the Year, Smartphone of the Year Award from Laptop Magazine, and, and so on. It was a wonderful experience. Um, Google sold Motorola. I moved back to Google. But one of the things that I'd, as I was thinking about this is that the whole time that I'd been at Google, I'd been working on trying to make impacts in the world of philanthropy. I worked on the Grameen Phone project. It was a fantastic project. Uh, traveled to Rwanda in uh, Tanzania to look at the installations of, the, of our technology there and learned a lot from those things. But really, the reality was that that kind of work was never going to be mainstream uh, at a company um, like any large technical company, technology company. So the opportunity to work, to apply my technical skills, work on cutting edge technology, but then use it for social good is really a heaven sent opportunity. And for me, that's what was exciting about, about this new role. And um, you know, my team works on big data, augmented and virtual reality. We work on artificial intelligence, of course, Internet of Things. And we do that with an eye towards commercialization, but a lot of it is with an eye towards social good. And that combination is very hard to find. And I believe that this model will be something that can really advance philanthropy in general. Um, as the forces that are pushing us towards more social good come forward, you know, increased investment in philanthropy, increased uh, awareness of what works and doesn't in philanthropy, and increased technology adoption and diffusion uh, throughout the world. Those macro trends, you know, are the, these are the technologies that we can write upon, and this approach is what we can write upon. And this is really the beginning of sort of a whole new chapter for technology uh, that at a scale that hasn't been seen before. And we're right at the start of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, your, your talk was, uh, for me personally, was um, uh, very sobering to, uh, to see the very negative impact that humankind is having on this planet. Uh, but, but at the same time, uh, also very exciting to see the opportunity that's ahead of us uh, to use uh, what we're doing in this community to uh, hopefully help the planet. 
So uh, as a very small token of our appreciation, uh, this is on behalf of ACM SIG Mobile for, uh, for giving us this wonderful keynote. Uh, we, we do have some time for some questions. Um, so, uh, so please, please uh, do line up and please thank the keynote speaker again. Thank you very much. So, so as, as people line up, let, let, let me start by asking the, the first question that's, that's been on my mind. So, so um, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, amount of work that, um, uh, that you're doing um, technology-wise to, to solve the problem. I, I also, you know, and, and all that technology can be used for, for tremendous good. I also worry that uh, similar technology could also be used for evil by poachers. And you know, for uh, the work that we tend to do in this community, we tend to be very open about it. You know, we publish papers, we we make our data sets available, uh, we openly talk about this technology. Uh, how should we think about you know this this duality of how this technology could also be used for evil by by poachers? And and you know, how should how should we as a community wrap our heads around that? Uh, that's a great question, and um, uh, in fact, it's a real question because we deal with it actually. Uh, but you know, one thing to note is that this is not um, specific to this to this area. Any technology that we develop can be used for good or evil, and you know, we've seen this, uh, for instance, with uh, security threats and uh, in our computer networks or mobile networks, increasingly viruses and and in fact, state-sponsored attacks. Um, and uh, I think we as a community have to deal with these things holistically. We cannot not build the network. We cannot not build the solutions uh, for fear of, of the evildoers. We're going to have to do it and do the best job. It will be an arms race, but in the long run, I'm pretty sure we'll come out ahead. Hi, right. Ravi. Good morning. We want Google. Yeah. Um, fascinating talk and obviously very impactful work. Um, one of the things I, I wondered at was some of the technical problems of the tracking elephants. Um, uh, to what extent would tagging technologies be an, be an alternative to the drones? And the other question was um, about the drones themselves. How much do you do? How much uh, processing do you do locally on the drone as opposed to streaming the video back and doing it in cloud or somewhere else? Great questions. And, and I have to say, one of the pleasures of coming to this conference is meeting people like Roy again and uh, former colleagues from Google. So it's wonderful. Um, no, both are, are great questions. So. Um, yeah, so I, I briefly refer to this. So um, the drone technology is really good because it's fast, it's cheap, and it can cover large distances in short amounts of time. Um, but it has its limitations. One of the major limitations is uh, foliage. And there are forest elephants, and in fact, those are even more endangered than savanna elephants. Um, at the risk of sort of grossing people out, uh, <laughs> the way we count uh, forest elephants uh, uh, is by teams of researchers um, that sample their dunk. And uh, basically, they take uh, you know, tiny little samples and they get DNA information and, and, you know, and, and, and use that as a, as, as, uh, uh, as a metric. Um, is, that has a variety of drawbacks, as you can imagine. Um, so yes, in fact, one thing we'd like to do is to see, OK, what other kind of sensors could be used? Obviously, camera traps could be one such thing. Not so useful for, for elephants, perhaps, but it could be done. Um, but the other way that it's done is by attaching collars to the elephants themselves. So you take a large herd of elephants and you attach a collar um, to, say, the, the matriarch. Um, and where the matriarch goes, the herd follows. And this is done right now. Uh, it's a painful process. Uh, it involves uh, uh, you know, desensitizing the elephant, knocking it out, attaching uh, the collar, which is typically a very heavy piece of uh, equipment. And, and you know, it lasts for a couple of years. But instead, suppose we could instrument the environment. If we knew their passageways, and we could have bioacoustic sensors, so we could look at the treads of the elephants. They're pretty distinctive. There aren't a lot of the animals with that same uh, signature. Could we do that in a less intrusive way? This is something that would be a, a great way to, you know, a great area to research, and um, could really revolutionize uh, how this is done. Could we look at foliage penetrating radar? Um, also, can we look at if we can, you know, all these forested areas that have at their edges savanna regions, can we survey the edges and try to predict where the elephants might go inside? So there's a variety of techniques that can be used. So great question on point. There's a lot of work being done, but mostly in the conservation side of the house. There's been very little work done by people like us who are experts in sensors and networks and so on. That's a great opportunity. And the other question was uh, offloading or yeah. processing on drone. Yeah. So currently, we're doing almost all processing on board. And we have a GPU and a CPU. And uh, the algorithms are running there. And the flight uh, operations are being done on board. Um, you know, that's obviously a challenge. We're using uh, 
you know, current generation hardware that's going to get better. Uh, but then our demands are getting up as well. We want to be better at recognition and be more, uh, you know, have to do finer grained uh, uh, recognition and so on. But what we found was that streaming the information back to a central control point had a variety of problems. There were the technical challenges of doing that, you know, internet, intermittent connectivity and all of that. But then now think about this. You've got a guy, and it's always a guy, uh, unfortunately, is sitting at a control post and watching video from a drone for hours, hoping to see something. And 95% of the time, there's nothing to see except Savannah. And it's just not a workflow that works. Um, so we were forced to try to do as much of the, uh, uh, the processing on board just because of the workflow constraints. All right, well, one more question. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm very inspired to hear that. Uh, I come from Bangladesh. I did my PhD from a fancy US university and went back. So uh, my question is a little bit uh, non-technical one. Um, so in all the philanthropic work, uh, when we talk about developing countries, the developing country is actually a consumer. Uh, we are sprinkling magic boxes here and there. And what happens uh, as a result of that, uh, the people involved or the people we are trying to help are not involved in the technology itself. They see it as a magic box. Something is magically happening. So I think the next, um, next way of helping them should be involving the local community into the technology, not giving them solutions right away. Uh, what do you think about that? Or do you have any plans on that? Thank you very much. A great question, and we are exactly on point. Um, I've been following this field for, for decades, actually, uh, as sort of a side uh, effort for mine, uh, of mine. Uh, but if you look back to the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of work on what was called appropriate technology. These were interventions of the type like um, solar cookers and uh, hand brakes for rickshaws and things like that. And the vast majority of those projects were not able to scale. Recurring reason for that was that they were purely technological interventions, and they were done top down. And this is a lesson that has been learned over and over. And this is even the traditional philanthrop philanthropists have learned. You know, I've seen that. You know, the Ford, the Rockefellers, all of the foundations have have learned this. Um, you really have a conundrum because you need the involvement of the target population, and actually, that's not very different from a lot of the product development we do. When we go out and try to build a new smartphone. We actually do user focus groups. You do, uh, you know, market surveys. You do, you know, uh, competitive analysis. And sometimes that that's forgotten. Um, but the other part of this is that um, the conundrum part of it is that um, often there isn't the capacity at the local level that you don't have the skill sets that you need sometimes for the solutions to emerge. Um, sometimes they do, and when they do, it's a wonderful thing. But not always. Um, you're not going to find. Uh, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence expertise in, in many of the countries that we work in, for instance. Um, but you will find a lot of software development expertise in places like Kenya and, uh, and you know, other countries. So finding that partnership where we can use the local expertise as much as possible and try to contribute to it, and then bring in just the catalytic portions that uh, we happen to have access to. That's, that's the conundrum. How do you make that, that blend work? Um, anything that's done top down without involvement from from the market is just going to is doomed to fail, and uh, that's the fine line we have to walk. Okay, so so I know there are more questions uh, ahead, and 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 also there are a number of other questions as well that people have asked in the application. My apologies, we are running very low on time, uh, but uh, but however, um, our keynote speaker is going to be here. And, um, and we have a break right now, so I do encourage you to come talk to Ravi. He's, he's a fantastic person as well to talk to one-on-one, -on -one, so I, I highly recommend you do that. Uh, so let's please thank our keynote speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.